Hello and welcome to Swipe. Coming up, saving the world one game at a time. Can gamification bring about social change? Candy Crush Saga, the addictive little game, celebrates half a billion downloads. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Lady Gaga taking to the skies. And we've got a superhero mashup in this week's games review. The world of gaming often gets a bad rap in the media, with negative headlines over sexism and violence cropping up again and again. But in recent years, other sectors of society have looked to it for inspiration and as a tool for social change. Sky's Katie Spencer explains the growing trend of gamification. Tony Selman is not your average gamer, but then Cell Slider is not your typical gaming title. Players like Tony are citizen scientists using real-life data to categorise tumours. Having lost both his sister and wife to cancer, as well as battling the disease personally, playing this game is about clicking to help find a cure. If it were not for the one and a half million pe uh, people who I think have already gone and played this game, um, lots of information that wouldn't be available to the scientists uh, is now available to them. Cell Slider was developed by Cancer Research UK in response to the high volume of data that scientists have to analyse. By sharing the workload, the game is speeding up life-saving research. It's proving so successful that the charity hopes to move onto the mobile market next year by launching a smartphone app. We want to develop a game which is played because of its intrinsic enjoyment um, and that will be really attractive but to people. Something where they can just give five minutes of their time to curing cancer, um, whether they're standing in the queue at the post office or sitting on the tube. Gaming can often get a bad rap, but in recent years, using game mechanics to engage users in solving problems has led to some incredible projects. Like Fold It in the US, the protein folding game that's helped make a breakthrough in AIDS research. Through crowdsourcing, players solved a puzzle which had baffled scientists for a decade in just three weeks. And you think, well, how can they do this if they're not experts? I think that's the key, the fact that they're able to think outside the box. You suddenly have this freedom um, that, you know, you, you don't have these blinders of, of uh, all this, you know, preconceived notions about how proteins fold. Medical research isn't the only area to benefit from the world of gaming. Touch Surgery is a mobile app which is helping surgeons practice operations on the go. We take a user through an operation and break that operation down into individual steps and key decisions um, and combine that with realistic 3D graphics to really produce as much of an immersive environment as possible. Gamification is not without its critics and there are many who feel uncomfortable with its use by corporations to sell products. However, it's an area which many health professionals believe is already helping us to do things like lose weight and stop smoking. We're really keen to find new ways of trying to change behaviour and gamification has really attracted people across the spectrum. Scientists and games designers may seem unlikely partners, but when it comes to making a contribution to areas like medical research, advocates believe this work could one day mean the difference between life and death. Katie Spencer, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. The sweet, time-wasting treat that's been downloaded half a billion times. But first, diminishing attention spans and the rise of microblogging and social media were thought to be the nails in the coffin of long-form storytelling. But out of those ashes comes Atavist, a company which wants to breathe some digital life into old-school journalism. Well, overall, I would say Atavist is, we kind of think of it as a storytelling company. So uh, we tell stories, we help other people tell stories. Um, that sort of manifests itself in two major ways. One of them is that we publish long form journalism and we also do a lot of multimedia production on our stories. So we include video, we include audio, we include uh, interactive graphics and all sorts of uh, whiz bang things. 
people had sort of come to the conclusion that uh, no one wanted to read long form on the web. So if you looked at blogs or you looked at sort of where things were going with Twitter and social media, there was a sort of conventional wisdom that there was no point in doing uh, long stories on the web because everyone's attention span was so low and it wasn't worth the money to spend. So that was sort of where we were running counter to everything that people were saying. But uh, in the interim, I mean, since we launched, uh, the tide has turned a little bit on that. So now you see a lot of people trying to do long form on the web. With our multimedia production, we're always trying to keep someone inside the story. So things that you might go look up from the story, for instance, uh, you know, music. If we have a story about music, we'll generally try to include music clips and a soundtrack in the story. And the idea is to keep the reader inside and not give them any reason to go out and find something else. We always call it immersive storytelling, for lack of a better uh, word. But, you know, the New York Times has done a lot of great stuff. The Washington Post has done a few stories, but also publishers that you might not expect, like ESPN Online has done really incredible stories that are designed in very clever ways with media that's integrated in a way that when you see it, you say, oh, this is how this should look. This, this feels like a different experience. You're watching Swipe coming up. The king of selfies. Justin Bieber launches a new app. But first, are you one of the army of people that's addicted to Candy Crush Saga? Each day it's being played over 700 million times somewhere in the world. And in just one year, it's been downloaded half a billion times. Sky's Chloe Culpin reports. It isn't a piece of cake getting half a billion people to buy your game, but at the Stockholm offices of games developer King, the company is celebrating hitting that important milestone. Not bad for a game which only launched as an app one year ago. Candy Crush is the first game ever to be number one on iOS, Android and Facebook at the same time, as more and more of us are taking the time to line up our suites. Produced with the casual gamer in mind, part of the Swedish company's success has been to draw in non-gamers. There hasn't traditionally been as many games for women and that has uh, been something that we at uh, King have, have been uh, rather good at, uh, making sure that it's a uh, non-violent concept and it's uh, um, easier to get into the game and it, it's a lot of fun. Keeping it short and sweet could be one of the secrets to Candy Crush's success. Experts say, on average, we tend to play on our mobiles in 60 to 90 second bursts. But not everyone finds it so easy to put the game down. I'm on level 438 at the moment. Um, it's taken quite a lot of time and dedication to get there. My wife gets a bit upset when watching telly and I ignore her for half an hour. Um, <laughs> but, and, and some of my friends are a bit upset that I'm at quite a high level. <laughs> The increase in the number of people with smartphones has transformed the gaming industry, making the mobile market a key player. I honestly think that we're looking at the last of the sort of dedicated traditional hardcore consoles with the launch of PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. I think that those devices are becoming more and more, you know, they're expensive, they're becoming more and more complicated, they do all these different things. Whereas mobile gaming is, has become more and more simple and easy to get into. It's, it's a, there's no barrier to entry when it comes to mobile devices. The sweet matching game's success has been phenomenal, but it still has some way to go before it ruffles the feathers of one of its mobile rivals. Candy Crush's figures are big, but not quite as big as Angry Birds. To match that success, it'll have to get more than 1.7 billion downloads. Chloe Culpin, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. The reboot of a cult classic in our games review. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed over the last few days. There are reports Snapchat has rejected a bid to be bought out by Facebook. According to the Wall Street Journal, the image messaging firm has rejected an acquisition offer worth £1.9 billion. The Conservative Party has come under fire for trying to hide 10 years worth of speeches, press releases and blogs from the internet. The material, which dates back to 2000, has been hidden from public view on the party's website and, according to some reports, even from search engines like Google. A spokesperson for the Tories said the changes are to allow people to quickly access the most important information.
How about using 3D printing to make some of the museum artefacts you love at home? America's Smithsonian Museum has launched a new 3D archive where you can see things like the Wright Brothers' first airplane, a skeleton of a woolly mammoth, loads of stuff in fact, so you should check it out. The collection can be viewed on screen or, here's the exciting bit, recreated if you've got a 3D printer. One for the Beliebers out there now. Justin Bieber's ready to give Instagram a run for its money. The singer has launched his own app called Shots of Me, designed purely as a means of sharing selfies. And finally, while we're in a musical mood, that shrinking violet Lady Gaga has come up with the world's first flying dress. Dubbed Volantis by the singer, unfortunately it only propelled her a few feet off the ground before bringing her back down to earth. But I suppose it beats the meat dress. From tactical war games to Marvel superhero mashups, we're in a fighting mood in this week's games review. Xbox's Aoife Wilson casts a critical eye over this week's releases. Deadfall Adventures, it wants to be this grand sort of adventure epic, but it just misses the mark. I mean, it borrows from things like Indiana Jones, of course the Uncharted series, it borrows from that in a big way, but it manages to kind of take all these elements and yet completely miss what made those series quite so special. So take the main character, for example, uh, James Quatermain. Um, he's like um, he's like Uncharted's protagonist, Nathan Drake, in almost every way. I mean, he's got like that right down to, you know, the, the famous um, ancestor, but he's just really unlikable. It's first person shooter, and it's also got some puzzle elements. And the first person shooting, it's unsatisfying, and the puzzles are just also unsatisfying, so it's not great. I mean, if you're really desperate for your sort of, you know, 1930s swashbuckling adventure, go for it, but just go in with your eyes open. So it feels a little bit unfair to compare any game to the near flawless Portal series, but with Mag Runner, it doesn't really leave you with much other options. Where am I? How is this possible? How am I breathing? Kamaji! Kamaji! <laughs> It's a first person puzzle solver, so instead of in Portal you have two set, you know, a set of portals that you use to complete um, test chambers. In Mag Runner you've got a glove which um, it gives uh, certain objects uh, magnetic properties. And uh, quite converse to actual laws of physics, in Mag Runner uh, um, items of the same polarity attract each other and opposites repel each other. So it starts off, you know, like your your, gener your general sci-fi, but then it kind of becomes, uh, it kind of twists and then it gets interesting because it has um, like horror element and it introduces the kind of Cthulhu mythos. So it's very Lovecraftian. Um, and that's where it sets itself apart from Portal, I think. But, you know, it's, it's magnets and madness is kind of how I'd sum it up. Cosmic bricks, the world will be mine. Lego Marvel Super Heroes proves that you can take a familiar formula and make it fresh. So it's it's got that Lego thing of taking a popular franchise and putting a Lego spin on it. Okay, people, let's go to work. This is the only game where you'll see the X-Men, the Avengers, Fantastic Four, and Daredevil, my favorite, um, all together in the same game. And that is something that Marvel comic book fans are really going to love. So you've got the usual thing of, you know, smashing up scenery and stud collecting and fighting and uh, exploring and it's just it just still feels fresh and still feels exciting so you've got like this mad like open world new york um that you can explore and there's um there's a huge 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 amount of replayability um i can't rave about it enough it's really fun hello commander a new enemy now threatens the future of mankind XCOM Enemy Within is kind of a standalone expansion to last year's XCOM Enemy Unknown. So, if you've played that game, you kind of know what to expect. With Enemy Within, um, it's introducing uh, about, I think, 47 new maps, uh, new enemy types, uh, new, um, new like, uh, unit types, and um, you're also... Uh, there's enough. There's enough of a new story there that it's it's worth a, a replay. I think um, the main new introduction is uh, an enemy resource called Meld, um, and there's about 
two little drops that are put down in, in each map of meld and the big uh, way that it changes the game is it puts a rush on things. So whereas before people could kind of hold back and kind of play things more carefully, now you're encouraged to play a little bit more aggressively. I mean, it really does change the game quite significantly. So I'd say that if you haven't played uh, the XCOM series before, this is absolutely the definitive version. However, if you have played it before, there's enough of a change here that uh, you'll get plenty of new stuff from it. That's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up with all the breaking tech stories all week on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone apps and skynews.com. See you next time.